You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Bellying up to my nine-foot homemade oak bar. Pour yourself a cold one. My name is Chris. His name is Ed. And for the next 30 minutes of Socks, we will bring you a show for fans, by fans, and brought to you by Family Waterproofing Solutions. Now, you, you hear Family Waterproofing, you try to figure out to yourself, well, what do they do? I'm sure they deal with seepage. Exactly. Water in the basement. Exactly. But they also take care of, like, if your walls are bowing down there. If you need to encapsulate your crawl space. Uh, You got concrete rising and falling around the property. You got foundation cracks. You got drain tile systems that need to be installed. They're doing gutter services now and drainage solutions for your entire yard. They'll also replace sump pumps. They'll do exterior wall ceiling. They do all of these different services and they do it at a great price. They are highly rated. They do excellent work and they've been with Saxon Basement now for a long time. We highly recommend Family Waterproofing Solutions. And remember, if you mention us, you get a good chunk of money off. Visit them today at FamilyDry.com or give them a call 708-330-4466. Uh, you know, I, I'm hearing things about the White Sox being very aggressive in the trade market right now. I've had a few people kind of reach out and, and give me, you know, here's what's going on and, you know, this is what's going on in and around the team and this is what I'm hearing and You know, it sounds like that they're being very aggressive trying to add players. Unfortunately, it sounds like that they have been asked for guys like Michael Kopech. And they're saying like, no, we're not, we're not giving up Michael Kopech. We're not like, would you, would you give up Michael Kopech for a second baseman right now or an outfielder? You wouldn't do that, right? That's that's crazy talk. So the problem is that the price that is being asked of them is way too high. And of course they can't make a move right now. They have to wait till the price comes down. And that's if the price comes down. Right. And and this goes back to the issue that we had in the offseason with the fact that they didn't increase anything payroll-wise. You know, I understand that some free agents might not have signed with the White Sox just to be a reserve player. That's a that's a solid argument. But in the offseason, the fact that you were just planning on Andrew Vaughn being the DH and couldn't add another bat that could play in the outfield or just a professional bat that could play outfield infield that would come in very handy right now with all these injuries, you wouldn't feel the pressure and other teams wouldn't feel like they could hold you up if you wouldn't have cheaped out in the offseason. If you wouldn't have kept the same budget that you had from 2020 into 2021, if you would have uh, not spent the money after saying that the money would be spent, you wouldn't be in this position. There's nothing you can do about it now. But that contributes to it a little bit because imagine if you would imagine if this team would have gone out and they would have grabbed one more bat that could play the outfield that would have solved one of these corner outfield positions, especially after Jimenez goes down. That but would have been the plan to start at designated hitter. And heck, if Vaughn beats the guy out, Vaughn beats the guy out and he ends up on the bench. But a, a free agent would have felt like he had a very good shot at being a starter on this team if they would have gone out and gotten that extra bat. And when they didn't go and do that. They 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 weaken themselves just enough that now teams are holding them up. Teams are saying, well, you're desperate. And because you're desperate, we want Michael Kopech. Or we want fill in the name of another player that you don't want to give up right now. And 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 that has put them in a really, really bad position. The Sacks now have to sit around and wait for the price to come down, and they don't know if the price is going to come down to go and pick a player. Like, they're not shopping like, hey, this is the best guy I want. Like, you know, I mean, we've been talking about, like, Adam Frazier would be the best guy to get, right? But if the Pirates are saying, well, we want Michael Kopech for Adam Frazier, <laughs> get bent, Pittsburgh. Like, no chance. Like, that's not happening. And so then what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, we have four or five guys that we could acquire that we think would be an improvement on our team other than what we have currently in our system, So now we're just trying to find whoever would give us one of those guys for the price that we could actually deal with. So you're not even necessarily getting the guy you want. You're getting the guy that you can actually acquire without killing yourself, trading away somebody that you don't want to trade away. And that's the position the Sacks put themselves in with how they set themselves up before the season. 
You know, they didn't they didn't make a move when they could have made a move to go for it in 2020 in the shortened season. We all gave them a break. COVID season, this team's at the beginning of its window. Why do that? We all gave them a break. In the offseason, they didn't increase their payroll. And then because they didn't increase their payroll and because they didn't go out and get that one extra hitter, which they could have very easily have gotten, they could have very easily have found a free agent that felt like they had an opportunity at worst to be the designated hitter on this team. And instead, what they did is they said, no, this is our team. I got I got my my players are on the court. Isn't that what Han said? My players are on the court. Or I've got my whatever he said. And in the end, they didn't increase any money and they lost a little bit of depth. And then when the injury bug hits, teams know they're weak. And they're like, why would I give you anything? It's just like if you were playing fantasy football or fantasy baseball, would you would you help out another team in the league when you know you could hold them up? And they know how desperate the White Sox are right now. And so now you get these ridiculous things like, oh, can you give us Michael Kopech? No. From what I understand, this is the kind of thing they're dealing with right now. And they have to wait. So if the price doesn't come down, the question is, are there things the team can do between now and and when you start to get back some of the talent you're waiting to return, that can get you to that point. And you wrote a very interesting article on it that's up at SoxInTheBasement.com. Tell everybody a little bit about it, Ed. Well, yeah, because you've got the greater issue here, and we talked about this going out of the offseason as well, is that the Sox didn't set themselves up with a great deal of depth, right? The rebuild is very much on the field in the major league sense because there's not a lot left down in the minors. And there isn't somebody like, say, Luis Robert or Eloy Jimenez sitting down there right now that you can call up and just say, okay, I'm going to plug this guy in. That guy was allegedly Andrew Vaughn. And to a lesser extent, you're mean Mercedes. That was a little bit more of a surprise. And those guys are, you know, and I touch on them in, in, in the article, but those guys are rookies who what you hope for out of them is, is that they will go through the league a second time now and start to adjust back and figure it out and that they don't have a tell and they don't have a hold. I've got some concerns about Vaughn that I kind of go into in there. We've talked about your mean, maybe having a, a, you know, too much of a crutch for it with his timing at the plate that a pitcher just pausing for a second in, in his windup can throw him off, but you're going to have to, basically try and cobble the team together a little bit, right? You're talking about what you're concerned about when it comes to Andrew Vaughn. That, and that piques my interest right away there. Because it was funny how you put him and Mercedes in the same sentence. See, in my mind, just somebody watching the ball games, knowing their pedigree, and seeing how your mean has completely fallen off the face of the earth, I'm far more confident in Vaughn getting better than I am in Mercedes. But you basically... Talked about them in the exact same breath, which which scares the hell out of me. Well, okay, so look at your mean Mercedes history. Now he is he's older. He has been around a long time in terms of the minors. He's kicked around a bunch of different leagues, and he's hit at every level. Right, he's got some good stats every stop, and it's been as a part time player because he's basically been a you know a backup catcher or a guy who's doing a timeshare behind the plate at every minor league stop. So. My concern about him is, you know, how much are those minor league stats real? You know, is he ready to be an everyday player? Is this him being exposed because he's not just being put in there for certain matchups? With Vaughn, we had talked about the 55 games, right? He only had 55 professional games. But when you look at what he did and you look at his overall minor league numbers, when you factor in his short stinted rookie ball where he just absolutely crushed, I mean, hitting over 400, OPS of like 1.2. I don't have it in front of me, but he absolutely destroyed the ball. And then the remaining games, the the remaining 40 games, 39 games, were at Winston-Salem and Kannapolis, right? So those are your A-ball level uh, in the minors for the Sox. And at Winston-Salem and Kannapolis, he was very consistent with both levels. Um, He hit around 250, and he had an OPS in the 700s. And right now, if you look at some of his, you know, you look at what he's actually hitting and then you look at some of the expected uh, when you get into the stat cast stuff, he's basically expected to be hitting around 247 right now and have an OPS in the 700s. He's actually hitting in the 230s with an OPS in the 700s. So my concern about Vaughn is we've now seen him at three stops. And if you throw out the rookie league stuff where he comes in and just and just is otherworldly for for a handful of games, 
his small sample size leans far more to a guy who's going to hit 250 and have a good, not a stellar, not an all-star OPS, you know, not huge power numbers, but he's going to be a good hitter, right? So he has opportunity to grow. He's only 23 years old. He does have a huge pedigree. His NCAA numbers are fantastic. But then when you also compare him to somebody like, say, Luis Gonzalez, who I think everybody, every Sox fan, you say, well, maybe Luis Gonzalez can help you. Right. You know, because what is he? He's not been mentioned. He doesn't have a huge pedigree. No. And in fact, he wasn't even playing that well in AAA. Like, I was looking through the AAA numbers. Like, this was not the guy. This was not the guy I expected him to bring up. Well, I'm getting there. All right. But compare him at Winston-Salem in Kannapolis. All right. So when he's down there, he's hitting 300 and his OPS is over 800 at both stops. Right. He goes to Birmingham. Birmingham sucks the life out of a lot of hitters. And and his numbers were pretty pedestrian. Now, he's been bad in spring training last year, this year, and he was bad at AAA Charlotte. So I don't really know what Luis Gonzalez is. But if you're going to compare somebody who's got, you know, a lesser pedigree in the in the college game, does well at the A-ball level that Andrew Vaughn did okay at for 55 games, we're sitting here talking like Andrew Vaughn is going to take another step or has another gear in him that you want him to find this year. But I'm a little concerned that, it's a longer path for him to get to that next gear. And if we're looking for him to hit it in 2021 and we're looking for him to find some second level and take another step or take another leap or whatever cliche I can come up with, because I think I used all of them in one sentence there. If we're looking for that for 2021 and to get into the playoffs, I don't know if it exists for him right now. It may be something where 2022, 2023, that's where we see him take, you know, take it to another level. You know, I get muscle aches all the time. I've gone from being able to do whatever I want to and not feeling any pain to basically getting pain for any kind of physical activity. Good news, there's a local family-owned Southside business that provides a CBD topical that will not break the bank. Creaky Bone Balm offers concentrated relief for creaky bones. It is an effective hemp-based CBD in a rejuvenating balm. And guess what? It's made in small batches always free of preservatives and all natural ingredients. It's great for muscle aches, tension, inflammation, joint pain. You can even use it for skin ailments like burns and dry cracked skin. Right now, go to creakybone.com and use the promo code BASEMENT. Get 20% off your order. And now check out the new 2,500 milligram balm with reduced pricing on their classic balms right now at creakybone.com. This goes back, though, to the issue in the offseason. Like, we were all excited about the fact that Andrew Vaughn can hit. And we, but, but why isn't there another major league hitter here to, to push him? Right. If there would have been another hitter that they would have gone and gotten in the offseason and Vaughn wasn't ready yet then he would have started in the minors and then he would have been one of the guys we brought up and we'd be happy with what he was doing right now. I'd be like, well, at least this guy's doing something. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll kind of pick it up. And and then the other issue is that if there wouldn't have been any injuries, this guy would have gotten more, more of a chance to be seasoned in the minors. Listening to you talk, it feels more and more like they really screwed this up when it came to Andrew Vaughn because they cheaped out. They got cheap and, and it's more exposed now because of the injuries, but they got cheap. And now that now we're going to have to sit around, we're going to have to wait and see, can he figure it out at a major league level when I think he probably should have gotten a chance at a couple of minor league stops and shouldn't have been here in 2021. He's still doing a heck of a job. I'm a fan. Honestly. Yeah, Yeah, I am too. He has the ability to be like a hall of fame hitter. I still think, I still think that that's in him. Like he could be that good of a hitter, but he's overmatched in a lot of ways right now. Like, you see the star value, like when he takes, you know, a roll this Chapman deep in that game against the Yankees. You see him hit a couple of big home runs in games. I was at one of my more recent games that I actually attended. I saw him come up in a game where the Sox couldn't get a hit, and he broke the game open with a home run. And, and, And up to that point, the Cardinals have been controlling the White Sox throughout the entire game. So he has ability, but again, the the Sox decisions in the offseason are... There's a huge spotlight on them right now when you look at the things that they have to go through right now. And Andrew Vaughn's one of those guys. Spotlight's on him. Because what are you doing with this kid? Would he be treated differently if you weren't in such great need of his services right now? And is it to his detriment long term? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. 
know, as a fan watching it, though, it, it, it bothers me that we that that's where we're at right now. You know, I mean, look, we're, we're at a point where we're in first place going into the weekend. We are in first place, two games up on the Indians. All right. That's that's where and we're, the Indians are in deep trouble, too. Yes. And there are, they are nine deep, deep trouble. There are nine teams that are currently over 500 in the American League. Nine of them. The top five teams are getting into the postseason. You know, I mean, things could be a little screwy because of division winners and then the two wild cards. If the Sox were not leading in their division, they would only be a half game up for the second wild card spot. They are the fifth best record in Major League Baseball at this point. They have a light schedule compared to other teams they could be playing coming up here leading into the All-Star break. But we have to find a way now to limp through and get to the point where hopefully reinforcements are on the way. And we have to hope that those guys don't get injured and we <laughs> and, and get set back and that we don't experience other injuries. So the whole key now is what do we find internally while we're being held up, while teams are trying to take advantage of our plight, where we're spread thin because of the budget and the way that the team was constructed in the offseason? that we weren't able to handle a rash of injuries. And no, it's not a, it's not a normal amount of injuries. There are, there's far more injuries on this team than I would consider to be a normal amount of injuries that a Major League Baseball team would handle. But it is worse because of the way that the team was set up in the offseason. The, the, the way the team was constructed has exasperated some of the issues that we're having right now. So now the question is, what do we do internally? The first easy thing is Jake Berger on this team yesterday. Because he's killing the ball down in the minors, he can definitely rake against lefties, and he's starting to hit deep balls against righties. Because I saw him do that the other day, and and uh, he went off against right-handed pitching. I think he went like four for five and had a home run. So that guy can hit. I feel like he's going to be here soon. Are there other options internally that you went through that you're sitting there saying we can mix and match with these guys? And we could consider doing this. What 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 stands out to you as something that you would want to have moved right now? Well, I, I think Berger's a guy you can look at. The, the guy that I'm mystified as an up is Gavin Sheets. Because if you look at who's hitting at AAA, Sheets is one of the few guys who's actually putting together a decent season. And he is, he is really hitting well against righties. He is probably strictly a platoon guy. He is dog meat against left-handed pitching. But I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea that he's sitting down in Charlotte, even with Gonzalez being up here, who, you know, if you want to give the guy a shot, give him a shot and see if there's anything there. And maybe, maybe, you know, he's just a little rusty because he didn't play a whole heck of a lot the last couple of years. But, you know, Sheets is, they've called him up to be the 27th man. And if you're looking at putting him out in right field or, Frankly, putting him at the DH spot and having him platoon a little bit with your mean, it wouldn't be the worst idea. We're not getting a tremendous amount of production out of your mean right now. And maybe he comes back around and gets some adjustment done. And, and you got to be up there in order to do that, certainly. But I just don't understand why they wouldn't want to give this guy a shot, especially because... God, you look at what's going on in AAA and AA with this team, and you look at some of the stats, and it's it's not great. And what they have at Charlotte is guys like Tim Beckham and and you know Nick Williams and these these guys that were sort of the non roster invitee crowd that didn't make the team. And and so I, I really think it's Berger and Sheets internally if you're looking to call somebody up. Uh, but I really also think what it is 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 Tony's got to commit to certain things, and that that's got to include getting some of these guys out of there when they are clearly overmatched, especially some of the guys that are not hitting right-handed pitching. If your mean is struggling against righties and he's only hitting lefties, you got to put Lamb in the DH spot more then, and, and you, you got to sit this guy down a little bit more. Or if Vaughn is not going to be able to hit righties, you got to be able to put somebody else out there. I really do think that they at least need to get one other player in here. I don't think there's enough internally, but it's going to have to be matchups. You know, it's going to have to be on Tony, really, to find a way to do this. Imagine a player, and I know this is this is silly. I know that this isn't how it really works. I I know that there's other factors involved, and I know that it's triple A. But at this point, you need to find some offense. You need to find some offense. Imagine if I could give you a hitter between two guys. If I could create a player versus left-handed pitching and right-handed pitching. 
And I'm not even saying that they, they're, they're going to replace each other. I'm saying that Sheets is in the lineup against righties and Berger's in the lineup against lefties. Just to add a little bit more offense into a team that's starved for it, right? And let's say that this player that you would create out of these two guys against righties, 109 plate appearances so far in AAA, hitting 330 with a 553 slugging percentage for a 920 OPS. And this hybrid player that we'd be creating in 55 plate appearances in AAA so far this year against left-handed pitching, hitting 373 with an 863 slugging and a 1281 OPS. You know, there's not a lot down in the minor leagues. I get it. Um, but what are you saving them for? I guess that's the question I have. Like, what, what do you, if you can't go out and make a move externally and you're struggling offensively, what are you saving them for? Hey, gang, ever wonder what it's like to be a small business owner? It's confusing. Weird expenses coming out of nowhere. And when you throw in health insurance, forget it. Nobody understands how that works. If you own a business, big or small, it's one of the biggest expenses you have all year long. And yet, we all wait until open enrollment at the end of the year, and then we think to ourselves, next year, next year I'll get a jump on it. And then it's another year of paying way too much. If you're a business owner, big or small, HR representative that wants to impress the boss, give Butch Zemar of Elite Benefits of America a call. Save yourself or your boss thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars a year. Reach out to Butch right now, 708 535 3006 or shoot him an email butch at elitebenefits.net and be sure to check out the zmar podcast don't wait till the last minute put butch zmar to work for you now i feel like this is like something that the white Sox, and not only just the white Sox, but a lot of major league baseball teams do they're afraid if they bring up a guy to the majors and he has a bad week or two he's lost value and you can never move him and you can never trade him on the other hand think of how long you had Yermin Mercedes sit down in the minor leagues over all these years, and you never actually gave him a shot to come up and hit in the majors. Wouldn't it have been great to see him do that, especially during the rebuild? Think about what you could have gotten for him like two years ago, right? Oh, yeah. Like if the White Sox saw holes in his swing, and he came up and did that for a month or so, and then somebody came knocking, and you were able to not overexpose him what you could have done. So it's not always a good idea to keep all these guys and hide them in AAA and, and AA. Like every once in a while, it's okay to promote a guy. It's okay to say, hey, this guy's raking down at this other level. Let's see what he can do. He's better than a lot of the other options we have. That's why the Gonzalez thing didn't make a ton of sense to me. It didn't make a ton of sense to me. He's hitting under 200 in AAA this year. Right. And that's that's part of it is is you don't know what he is right now because his his stats down in AAA, 195 with a 644 OPS. And Sheets is at... 294 with an 834 OPS. And I understand that Sheets has a split issue there where, where like I said, he's raking against righties and bad against lefties. But uh, from the looks of it, Luis Gonzalez is bad against everybody. So, you know, he's a better outfielder. That's the only thing you have there is, is that he's a better outfielder than Gavin Sheets. So I understand that too, but still. Even uh, against know, lefties, even against lefties. First of all, we don't have, we don't, you don't see as many lefties and your team is so good against lefties. Just sit him down against lefties if he got up here, right? Right. Okay. Yes. But then even against lefties, his OPS is still in the mid 600s. And you got all kinds of guys that you keep trotting out there that are doing that poorly this year. All kinds of guys doing that this year. Well, we, we talked about, we talked about Zach Collins starting against a lefty just because he is apparently Lucas Giolito's personal catcher. Oh, make me, you know, and then, and then well, you saw that the other night, right? You saw that. You yeah. saw, we complained about it. We said it was ridiculous. Uh, the White Sox trot out Collins as, as Giolito's personal catcher against a lefty. He can't do anything. And the moment La Russa is able to get Grandal in there, all Yasmani does is hit a home run. And give the Sox the lead. Right. On the first it's pitch right that there. he sees. On the first pitch that he sees, Ed. And then he comes out the next day and he gets a big hit against the Pirates. But you're taking one of your most productive hitters right now. And I don't talk to me about his batting average. Talk to I'm talking about the amount of runs he creates. He's one of your big run creators on this team. And you're 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 keeping him on the bench because, you know, your pitcher prefers some other guy's glove over his glove. It, 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 that, that was on display. We yelled about it, and then it was 
proven right there on television for all to see. All within the same yeah, couple hour period. It's right there. It's right, it's right there, there in front of your face. Staring in front of you. But yeah, you're right. If they're gonna if they're gonna be able to drag Zach Collins out there against a lefty when he is not going to at least statistically, you don't expect him to do anything. Then yeah, bringing up Gavin Sheets and saying, look, he might struggle against lefties, but you know what? We can figure that out because if if Gavin Sheets is going to play, let's say he's going to play right field right now against a lot uh, most righties, and you know you might sit him every now and again, uh, you, you know play a matchup if there's some guy that looks like he might hit better or Jake Lamb's got a really good record against somebody or Brian Goodwin's got a really good record against someone, you can sit Sheets down for for one of those guys maybe. But if you're going to do that and then say okay, well on the days we're facing these lefties, we're going to put Larry Garcia out in the outfield and Danny Mendick in at second and take our chances there, I'm okay with that. And that's the kind of thing that if Sheets is able to come up and hit and is able to continue on what he's doing at AAA, then you got to platoon him. That's how we're going to get through this, okay? It's, it's something like that. But if you're just going to continue trotting out what's on the Major League roster, and if that includes, that's why I say, I, I Vaughn and Mercedes, really, I, I lump them together also because... They really are the key. If they both get up to a, a much more average hitter and, and can kind of contain some of the things that have plagued them here, and I, I, I agree with you. I think Vaughn has that ability. Frankly, I think Vaughn's underperforming a little bit based on what he could be doing. But if Vaughn gets up to, say, 252 with an OPS in the mid-700s, I think he's fine to play every day. I'm good with that. I'm even kind of good with that if Mercedes gets up there, or even if Mercedes has a fairly low batting average but starts, like, selling out for power, you know, if he wants to go that route. I'm okay with that, too, because that's an opportunity then for, say, Jake Lamb or Gavin Sheets to also share at bats with him, and you don't have to necessarily trot him out every day. I think they just need to be smarter about how they're handling those two guys and I also think that if those guys pick it up, if they do adjust and they do come back around, and you can throw in a Gavin Sheets or you can throw in a Jake Berger to help offset some of the deficiencies that they have, if those guys can come in and in limited playing time, not savior, not hero, no capes, no crosses, nothing like that, it's just coming up and being able to do a job against certain players – that's how they're going to get through to September 1st, and that's how they're going to be able to get through this period where your top four outfielders are all down, your starting second baseman is all down, and you are relying on a very unproven rookie DH, and you're getting held up by teams because what they want is something that you cannot possibly ever consider giving up, and you just don't have anything else in the minors that's of interest. The the Friday night lineup for the Chicago White Sox to kick off the weekend w- looked like what Tony probably feels is his best lineup against lefties. Remember, he had a day off, you know, two games against Pittsburgh and a day off. So all hands on deck, right? So that that lineup is what he believes is the most optimal lineup because everybody's available to him, right? Yeah. So Anderson at short, Goodwin in center, followed by Moncada at third and Abreu at first. Followed by Grandal for some reason DHing because Rodon needs Collins as well. Okay. Vaughn in left, Garcia in right, Zach Collins against a lefty at catcher, and Danny Mendick at second base. And let me tell you something right now. That looks like a National League lineup, those last four spots. You got the rookie that's trying to figure it out in Vaughn and very overmatched against lefties, Larry Garcia, Zach Collins, and Danny Mendick. You want to know how overmatched they are against lefties? Collins has a 555 OPS against lefties, Garcia 588, and Mendick a 536. So now you're telling me that this team couldn't use the two guys that are raking in AAA right now? Berger's 1281 is definitely better than those three, and Gavin Sheets' 659 is 100 points higher. Yeah. I mean, he sucks against lefties, but he's better than those three guys. I guarantee you Tony La Russa would want to have a little bit more help against left-handed pitching. And this and when you and when you go and you roll over the right-handers, I guarantee you could find a spot for Gavin Sheets to be out there hitting or at least available to him when he's when he's creating his lineup. And I, and I would say right now elevate Gavin Sheets and Jake Berger. I I I would say at this point it takes pressure off of you in the negotiating room when you have teams thinking that they have you over a barrel 
and it gives your your manager more options. You you look at the optimal lineup that Tony La Russa felt that he had and his bottom four guys in that lineup, and you can find a spot for both of those guys in that lineup. I'm not saying they play every day, but I'm saying that, it, that these are guys that can actually help you if they can give, I mean, look, if they lose, if their OPS drops by, you know, 15% when they get up to the majors, they have like a, look, when we got to the majors, I was really good in AAA and I got a little bit of a change because the competition changed on me. There's still, there's still room for them on this roster right now. The Luis Gonzalez thing didn't make very much sense to me in terms of bringing him up. And I can, I see a manager right now that does not have the best 26 guys that the team could provide for him right now. They could give him better players right now available to him on his major league roster that are available down in AAA, in my opinion. And and it helps, and it helps with your negotiating because let's say one of those guys comes up and actually starts hitting. Let's say that you find another lightning in a bottle, even if it's for like a month. And it's not even Yerman lightning. You know, it's not that first month of Yerman Mercedes, but it's good enough that when somebody sits there and says, well, you're going to have to give us this prospect because otherwise you guys are sunk. Han can shoot back. Have you seen what Berger's doing? Have you seen Gavin Sheets lately? I mean, the kid's been up there for the last 14 days and he's doing just fine. I'm just looking to be a little safe. I can take or leave this deal. Give yourself a little bit more at the negotiating table while you're trying to swing some of these deals and give your manager a few extra bats because the bottom three guys in the lineup on Friday night have OPS is in the 500s. It's brutal. It's brutally bad. 600s are bad. 500s are just horrid. They make your skin melt off your face. Like when you look at the Ark of the Covenant at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what the 500s do to me. And you've got three of them in the lineup on your optimal lineup coming out against a left-handed pitcher. That's brutal. If Pittsburgh saw Gavin Sheets and Jake Berger as being guys that they wanted... Adam Frazier could be here right now. Yeah, but they're not asking for them. They're not asking for those guys. Right. They're asking for future ace Michael Kopech for right. Adam so Frazier. At, th- at this point, go go use the guys that nobody wants because they could only gain value for you if they actually come up and start hitting in the majors. Why not? Let's, let's, let's go for it. You don't even need to add them to the 40-man roster. They're both on there. They're both available. Right. Your only position players that are on the 40-man roster that you don't have on the IL or aren't on the team right now are Mike Rodolfo, uh, Blake Rutherford, Zebi Zavala, and then Sheets and Berger. Okay? So you don't even need to add them. Yeah. You don't even need to add them to the 40-man. Just bring them up, use them an up. option, and, and give them a shot for a couple of weeks. Let's go. Come on. Let's do something. For, you know, what? are we going to wait until we're down two games to the Indians before we do something? Is that the plan? Like we're gonna, we're just gonna keep leaning on the fact we're in first place because it looks good in the marketing materials, or are we gonna make sure that we stay there? Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always on socksinthebasement.com.